From Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American original. For over two decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. The McLaughlin Group is brought to you in part by Grant Thornton dedicated to serving clients worldwide with a singular passion for the business of accounting. And by SAP, software for great companies, not just great big companies. Learn more at sap.com slash midsize. And by CIT, capital redefined. Issue one, miserable April. I'm focused on uh, keeping our economy strong. We've created almost 8 million jobs since August of 2003. Uh, strong labor markets, inflation seems relatively contained. The consumer is, 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 is still robust. Despite uh, Treasury Secretary of, Hank Paulson's of, of sales pitch, not all indicators are rosy. Last month's job creation rate was an anemic 88,000. Optimists who predicted a rebound in the housing market in spring 07 are now saying sometime in 08. April retail sales show that although high-income Americans are still on a spending spree at Nordstrom's and Saks, middle and lower-income Americans have cut back sharply at Target and Walmart. What's crimping these largest sectors of our public? Although oil inventories are at a seasonal high, gas prices now average almost $3 a gallon nationwide, and inflation has driven up the wholesale cost of every food in America from Coca-Cola to pork ribs and chicken. That's why economists were particularly alarmed last month to see consumer and household debt hit record high, despite the downturn in spending. The reason consumers are increasing household debt? People are using credit cards to pay for the basics, food and health care. Question, is the economy at a turning point, Jay Carney? Well, I think any economist you ask might give you a different answer. It's impossible to know, but there are troubling signs. And, and I think one of the signs that we're seeing is that a lot of these uh, uh, arm loans that people took out during the housing boom, a lot of these uh, loans that had fixed rates for five, three, five, or seven years have come due. Their rates have gone up. People are squeezed. They're Add, you know, they're, they're paying for their houses by uh, their mortgages by, by uh, uh, adding more debt to their credit cards, and they're feeling a pinch between gas prices and their mortgages and health care costs. So I think, uh, you know, is there a turning point? Do I think we're heading for a recession? Uh, it doesn't feel like it to me, but I think there is certainly a downturn, and growth is not what it could be. Is this a story between Main Street and, and Wall Street? The Dow keeps hurtling along, but on the Main Street level? medium and uh, poor class people are having a hard time of it? Well, I hate to sound too much like John Edwards, but there is definitely a story about growing income inequality in America. And that translates also into a corporate story because, as you pointed out, we are seeing that the luxury goods companies are doing really well and the companies that cater to people who aren't quite so rich aren't doing so well. But I do also think we should be a little bit cautious about calling a recession right now. The retail figures are worrying and the American consumer has been keeping America and the world going. But there are other things that are driving the economy, including the fact that other parts of the world are really quite vibrant right now. Why is it so hard to assess the direction in which the American economy is moving? Well, if you can determine when a market's going to shift, you can become a very rich person very quickly. It's, it's, it's never sudden. You have a lot of factors here. Uh, unemployment is at 4.5 percent. That's, that's not just rich people and, and upper middle class people working. That's virtually full employment. That's virtually everybody getting a job. You have, when you take out energy and, agri and agriculture, inflation is, 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 is comfortable. That's what Bernanke looks to. Uh, the world economy is looking pretty good, so we're not going to get into a into uh, a cycle of, of the world economy all turning down at the same time. On the other hand, the housing market's taking its time coming back, but you are seeing investment going into uh, house repair stocks. So I think it's a mixed bag, and, and uh, I'm not betting either way. Uh, Maria, welcome. Do you think that we have a dual economy, and that's the problem? We have uh, multinationals that are fattening themselves off globalism. We have a domestic economy 
uh, which is facing all kinds of disorders. John, I think things are going very well, frankly. Um, the rest of the world is growing and is incredibly vibrant right now. You said unemployment at 4.5%. Come on, that's virtually full employment. Inflation is relatively low. Um, uh, wages are going up. Yes, there is a, a, an income gap that needs to be addressed, for sure, but the world is getting richer. This is a positive. That's going to be a positive for American companies at the end of the day. You uh, interviewed, and that bite we used at the beginning of uh, Hank Paulson was uh, from your interview. What was the central point he was making in that interview? Well, he was making the point that the global economy is doing well, and while there are issues, the housing market has slowed, the automotive industry remains weak, the retail sector is weak, that the global economy is doing well. He looked around the world, he talked about Japan, Brazil, Vietnam, Southeast Asia, Europe. For the first time, you're even seeing Germany break out of a funk. He was complaining about there not being enough foreign investment in the United States. Was that was that the theme that was throughout that uh, that interview? Absolutely. He's he's launching a new campaign to try to get international companies to reinvest in the United States. It peaked at about three hundred and sixty billion dollars in the year two thousand. Last year, direct foreign investment was at one hundred sixty billion. So things have definitely tailed off after September eleventh, and he's trying to reignite that. And Following that story. And it's, and it's surprising, isn't it, given the, the, the price of the dollar being so low that there wouldn't be more foreign investment. You know, I think it's not the job, the, the income inequality is not just a problem. It's at historic, mind-blowing highs. I mean, you're talking about uh, hedge fund winners who pull in enough money in a year to pay 80,000 teachers in a year. And, and I think that while this, because the economy overall and globally and nationally is not uh, tanking, you won't see rebellion in the streets, but I think it does politically help candidates like John Edwards and Democrats in general who are addressing economic anxieties at levels that the Republican candidates are not. Uh, Paulson is a globalist. He believes in globalism. And he fears a backlash against globalism, which I think a lot of us on this panel sense. Is that right? Absolutely. The democratic backlash against globalism. It's not just Because democratic. of the outsourcing of jobs. So he wants to prevent the outsourcing or, or keep it to a minimum. Therefore, he wants foreign investment here to uh, stabilize globalism. John, the problem is protectionism, okay? Dubai ports was not allowed to acquire a ports uh, the ports in this country. Sinook out of China was not allowed to acquire uh, Unical. There's protectionism seeping through countries, not just America, but all around the world. It's a negative. Yeah. But now, but on and, that, on and, that, and, hold and, on. And it's not, it's not about preventing outsourcing. I think this is one of the great myths in the economic debate. You can't stop outsourcing, and if you do, you make your economy slow down. It's a question of really participating fully in the world economy, and that's why this idea of saying, fine, our companies will invest outside the United States, but let's open yeah, I mean, up to let I mean, other companies invest I mean, here. You know, and France? I do think. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, it's, it's not just about 9-11. It's the fact that international companies really do feel that there is a hostility towards them in America. I mean, it's hard to enter the well, country. Look at by, by, by way of example, the, the French economy ha has been slumping for years because they've been protecting themselves from international trade. That's what the French election was substantially about, was recognizing you've got to be competitive in the world. If you try to be an, uh, a castle unto yourself, you get poorer. Well, and they that's said Dan and Yogurt was a national treasure that it, they, they didn't want it to be acquired. Italy doesn't want its banks to be acquired. It's <laughs> the housing bubble is burst. Uh, there's probably more to come. Do you, think I, I, I do I, do you think there's another bubble that's going to burst? The credit bubble? The liquidity out there is enormous? It's enormous. Uh, it, it certainly is the best of times in terms of accommodating uh, deals that have happened. You know, it could. If that bubble burst, will that be a ruin? It will be a, a, a disruption for the markets, for sure. Look, one of the good pieces of news is the deal that the White House and the Democrats uh, in Congress leadership have had on, on trade. We've been having this fight for years about, you know, Democrats demanding to have labor controls uh, for, for the other treaty countries. And you've now got with Charlie Rangel, chair, Democratic chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, he's got to deal with President Bush to be able to pass a bipartisan basis of Peru and, 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 and other trade deals. This is a very good sign that we're stepping in, take at least a half step back from the protectionist did Paulson, instinct. Did Paulson uh, uh, excoriate the Congress uh, subtly by uh, condemning Sarbanes-Oxley? 
You know, he did. And I don't think he blames it on Sarbanes-Oxley entirely. He's blaming it on this idea that the litigation environment is out of control, that people view America as having high compliance costs. That certainly has to do with Sarbanes-Oxley. But also the inability to get a visa. I mean, it's a lot of stuff going on that is, is giving people the perception that America is closed. And did that's he, what he wants to did change. Did he indicate to you at any time which one of the presidential candidates, presumably Republican, he favors? But Democrats, perhaps, that he likes the the economic philosophy of? He did not. He did not. Uh, a question. Earlier this year, Alan Greenspan, I think you broke this story. Alan Greenspan made waves when he predicted that we were in a recession, in for a recession in late 2007 or early 2008. Was he right? And if so, by which date? You got me? John, I would not... I would not judge those words. I wouldn't presume to know more than Alan Greenspan, and I wouldn't presume that he knows with any kind of precision when the next recession is going to come. We have been in a long period of growth. We have had an extended bull market. At some point, there's going to be a correction. Will it be just unsettling for the markets, as recent corrections have been, and not catastrophic? I hope so, but we just don't know. What do you think? Well, Warren Buffett has a great line, which is that the cemetery for Sears has a special section, a very large one, reserved for people who make macroeconomic predictions. <laughs> so I think that's absolutely correct. Having said that, I think that you pointed, John, to what is really the single biggest and hardest to grapple with issue, which is this liquidity. And on the one hand, the huge liquidity sloshing around there is part of this unprecedented global prosperity. It's part of the sophistication of financial markets. It's even part of the technological change. But the question we have to ask our ourselves is, can money remain so cheap for so long? And are there deals somewhere at a corporate level in terms of household debt that at some point will go wrong? I think that the biggest problem is the duality. Well, well I mean, if, I mean, if, if you legislate I think well, for, for multinationals, you're doing one thing. If you're legislating for the domestic sector, you're doing another no, I, thing. I don't think that addresses the, the state of the economy. But, but I agree with Jay. I, I'm, who, who, who am I to outguess Alan Greenspan? But I must say that the booming uh, stock market as a leading indicator of the economy would suggest that we're not imminently facing a recession. I don't yeah, think kind so. of avoid those lapses into humility, would you? <laughs> once, once every year. <laughs> Maria. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I'm not uh, making a prediction about recession or not, but I, I mean, my gut tells me no. It, we, things are going well. I mean, balance sheets um, have been so strong, strong as they've been in, in a, if you look at over a 10-year period. Um, Post-Enron, WorldCom, and the scandals that we, we got through, companies were not uh, taking many risks. They were risk-averse. They've cleaned up the balance sheets, and now they're, they're rich, frankly. Well, that's corporate level corporate level, and that does lift many boats. Well, the, uh, I don't know about that. I mean, you find that this oddity where people are not spending, and they're living by credit cards, and they're hurting. Well, the price of oil is certainly an issue, and the housing slowdown has been an inflation? issue for people. He doesn't seem overly concerned inflation. about inflation, inflation does he? Inflation came out this week, and it was flat when you strip out energy and food. I think, uh, I think uh, Alan is right. I think it's going to be uh, late 07 for our uh, touchdown with recession. When we come back on Iraq, Bush gives a little ground. Will he give more? Any global accounting organization must have highly specialized skills be able to go the distance for their clients and see the big picture to solve problems before they happen. But what distinguishes the accountants at Grant Thornton is their passion for the business of accounting. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. I've been hearing that SAP has business software for mid-sized companies. So naturally I did what you'd expect. Had my hearing tested. Turns out I'm fine. I love.
lost my job and my health insurance. The first thought was, how am I going to get my medication I need? I was in a lot of trouble. If you're uninsured and struggling, America's pharmaceutical companies want to help. Call 1-888-4PPA now to see if you may qualify. PPA saves me $1,300 a month. We've been to nearly 1,000 cities in all 50 states, helping more than 3 million people in need. Without my wife and PPA, I don't know if I could have been here today. The Partnership for Prescription Assistance, on the road to helping you. It fuels our lives and creates the products we depend on. It powers our workforce. It brings us home and gives us warmth. It lets us travel the earth and reach for the sky. Vital for life, too precious to waste. Oil and natural gas. Together, let's use it wisely. Learn more at energytomorrow.org. Issue two, Bush gives ground. President Bush this week agreed to negotiate war funding legislation for Iraq that would set targets for progress in Iraq. Uh, one message I have heard from uh, people from both parties and is that uh, the, the idea of benchmarks makes sense, and I agree. It makes sense to have benchmarks as a part of, uh, of our discussion on how to go forward. And so I've empowered Josh Bolton to find common ground on benchmarks. And uh, he will continue to have dialogue with both Republicans and Democrats. For their part, Democratic leaders have agreed to drop earlier demands for a timetable for ending U.S. military involvement in Iraq within nine months. But there's more. The House passed a bill Thursday night that would provide partial funding for Iraq, but suspend most of the money until President Bush gives them an update on progress in Iraq in two months, July. The president has brought us to this point by vetoing the first Iraq Accountability Act and refusing to pay for this war responsibly. He has grown accustomed to a free hand on Iraq that he had before January 4th. Those days are over. The bill passed 221 to 205 in defiance of President Bush, who early the same afternoon threatened a fresh veto. And so I'll veto the bill if it's, if it's this haphazard piecemeal funding. Question on the issue of Iraq. Is the House of Representatives ahead of the people? with the people or behind the people? Maria Bartiromo. I think it's with the people. I think that the House wants the troops to pull out, come home, but it doesn't want to appear that it wants to cut off funding for the troops. Uh, I think people want the troops to come Act home. Actually, if you, if you believe that the polling means anything, Congress is behind. The public is even more anxious to, to get out than, than the Democratic leadership in Congress is. I don't believe that polling, and I think the, the, the more experienced Democrats realize the public can be fickle, so that's why they're being cautious. But the public has been ahead of the Congress, even the Democrats, if you just look at all the major polling on I think that. The issue. House is certainly behind, uh, or rather ahead, of the Senate. The Senate Democrats are not going to go along with uh, the bill that passed the House unless, in that formulation. Unless the, uh, po the Parliament in Iraq takes a vacation well, in July that, and August, that, that and then could, the Senate will be forced. That to, could be a game changer. That would be that a, would force a, them a real, to, uh, a real going poke in the, the eye. It would be a real poke in the eye, and I think would incense a lot of people and would translate uh, pretty directly to the kitchen table in America that this is uh, not necessarily a war worth fighting. And sure. we also have to realize that everyone right now, all of these players are playing their own very specific political games. So we have going into the presidential election, each of the candidates struggling to define themselves. That is shaping things. And people in the House are really worried about their own fate. Okay, Cheney unchained. <laughs> Almost in tandem with the president, but unexpectedly, Vice President Cheney went to Iraq this week. He told the Maliki government to get serious about unity and about reform. I did make it clear that um, we believe it's very important to move on the issues before us in a timely fashion. They do believe we are making progress, but we've got a long way to go. 
As the Sunnis and Shias go about killing each other, the Iraqi parliament has yet to agree on these benchmarks. One, how to share revenues from Iraq's huge oil reserves between Shias and Sunni. Two, how to re-enlist former Ba'ath party members into government, thereby reconciling Shias and Sunnis. Three, how to dismantle violent private militias. Four, how to amend Iraq's constitution to equalize the rights of Shias and Sunnis. These are all major hurdles, and top Iraqi officials are not optimistic about clearing them, including Cheney's opposite number, the vice president of Iraq. I just can't see any light in the, in the, in the, in the horizon time being. To make matters worse, if not unconscionable, Iraq's parliament has scheduled a two-month July-August vacation. Question, is Cheney trying to thwart a political nightmare for the White House? Tony Blankley. Well, well yes, he's been trying to do that for several years now. Uh, I think he's got a real challenge. The, the current parliament is may not have the will and even the desire for, for many elements of it to reach an accord. Both the Shias and, and the Sunnis and the Kurds have their own view of, of, the, of a future and so far, I, I mean, I think we need to start thinking about if the parliament, if this government can't do the job, do we need to somehow come with another group of Iraqis who might be able to? If we're losing about a hundred soldiers dying every month, so do, do, the, do the Iraqis really think that we are going to continue doing that while they are are on summer vacation. What do you think? Well, isn't, isn't that the nightmare that Bush is, that Cheney's trying to avoid? It's uh, very politically undeft of the Iraqi parliament to have talked about that. But what I think is really interesting about the Cheney trip is the whole segment you've done on it. I mean, I think what we're seeing is the administration trying to shift the focus onto Iraq and saying this is not our responsibility. It's not a question of we broke it, we better fix it. It's a question of these Iraqis. And if they can get it together, great. But if they can't, sorry, it's not our right, fault. We did what we can and we're getting We got out, rid of which, the tyrants which, and your fault if you can't create a thriving democracy. Which is a heck of a long way from death throes and, and, and where, you know, where Cheney was uh, a year or two ago. You know, last week there was a period where U.S. personnel, uh, civilian personnel, were told only to leave their uh, homes and offices in the green zone uh, with uh, flak jackets and helmets. In the green zone. I still I, look, 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 I, I've, I've got to say, I think this is a complete misread of President Bush's intentions. I don't think Bush is looking for an opportunity to pass the buck to the Iraqis. I think he, he is committed to trying to make it work one way or the other, and he's going to do that until January 20th, 2009. Yeah, I think he does need some kind of a subtle uh, sort of backpedaling uh, and some kind of a shift of power so that they can start taking well, control. Well, he, he may well need it, but, but I don't think he's looking for an exit if he can't find one. He, he's not just looking for a political convenient exit. If he can't find one, he's going to stick. So is he going to stay until it's a democracy and everything is working He's going to stay great? until January 20th, Issue 2009. Issue three, panic slaughter. With you. Uh, U.S. Army Brigade Commander in Afghanistan, Colonel John Nicholson, issued an apology this week so extended and so remorseful as to be unprecedented in American military history. So I stand before you today deeply, deeply ashamed and terribly sorry that Americans have killed and wounded innocent Afghan people. We are filled with grief and sadness at the death of any Afghan. But the death and wounding of innocent Afghans at the hand of Americans is a stain on our honor and on the memory of the many Americans who have died defending Afghanistan and the Afghan people. This was a terrible, terrible mistake. And my nation grieves with you for your loss and suffering. We humbly and respectfully ask for your forgiveness. Colonel Nicholson is apologizing for a very bloody March day in Afghanistan. A Marine Special Operations convoy was hit by a suicide bomber in a van packed with explosives. Immediately after they were attacked, the elite unit fired on nearby non-combatants and all along the 10-mile route back to their base. The Marines took the lives of 19 civilians and wounded 50. It was the deadliest civilian killing in the country from a single U.S. action since the start of the war. Each of the families of the killed Afghan civilians was given $2,000 by the U.S. government.
Do you think that this kind of uh, ethics violation was a result of extended and multiple deployments and stress and strain owing to a war that seems to have no end? John, honestly, I, I, I don't know. I think that there's a lot of stress on our soldiers, uh, but I think that terrible things happen in war. The, 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 the problem is that this, the war themselves, both these wars are now becoming such a burden on the public that this is terrible news. We're running out of time. A quick answer? It's also particularly hard to fight a war when you're fighting against the local people. No, I mean, I, compared to any other wars, th these sort of things happen. I don't see this as any different. I don't think it's any more stress than our troops during World War II or Maria? Civil War. I think it's uh, very stressful, and, and I think uh, the American people are increasingly frustrated, and I think that uh, it's, it's a tragedy. But just to I you come back with, to Tony very, very quickly, if you come in as liberators, it is particularly bad to kill innocent civilians. That's what makes it different. Well, yeah, but we kill, we kill a lot of I civilians. Think uh, we got, and, we'll be right back with predictions. The McLaughlin Group is brought to you by Pharma. New medicines, new hope. And by the people of America's oil and natural gas industry. Learn more at energytomorrow.org. Today, for the first time ever, 90% of seniors have comprehensive prescription drug coverage. Millions of older and disabled Americans with peace of mind, thanks to Medicare's new prescription benefit. That's why leading newspapers say rushing to change Medicare would be a mistake. USA Today tells Congress, put on the brakes. The journal warns it's the last thing patients need. The Post says change is the wrong prescription. Medicare's prescription drug benefit, it's working for seniors. SAP is affordable solutions for companies like ours. I have a sneaky feeling the world of high precision electronic gas pressure gauges is about to change. Blue sky smiling at me. Nothing but blue sky. Today, there's a fuel that, when paired with advanced diesel engines, will help reduce truck emissions by 90%. And that means bluer skies and cleaner air for all of us. Introducing new ultra-low sulfur diesel from the people who bring you oil and natural gas. Learn more at energytomorrow.org. of time. Happy Mother's Day. Bye-bye.